All right, guys, welcome back to the Buck Fever Podcast. I'm Noah. Jake. And with us today, we have a very special guest, the second guest ever on the new <laughs> and improved Buck Fever Podcast, Mr. Mike McDowell. Welcome on. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a it's an honor and a privilege to be part of uh, the elusive Buck Fever Outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> elusive, I like that uh, word. Yeah, we're, we're very excited to uh-huh. have you on here, and... As you can see, we're rocking the same sweatshirt here, which must mean that sturgeon spearing is right around the corner. Uh, I think we're less than a week out, right? Just a couple days now. Um, And so that's one of the main topics we want to cover today, um, just being that it's so close. And you've got plenty of experience talking about sturgeon spearing. You've had a couple of years years devoted to sturgeon spearing now, so lots of stories, lots of... uh, knowledge and and whatnot so i guess we got to start from the beginning here how how did you get into spearing you know when you talk to people and lay people and you try to explain to them you know what spearing is all about and um and they kind of look at you kind of puzzled like uh staring down the hole some people use that analogy you know uh sit sit back in the fireplace preferably with it not on and then look through the chimney and then uh, sit there with like a shotgun and then wait for a a duck to go and then try to shoot it. Um, You know, it's an analogy that's given, but until you get out there and you sit in a shack and you see the opportunity to happen, a fish come through, um, or somebody to spear a fish when you're in the shack, I mean, or you get an opportunity to do something like that, I mean, you're hooked for life. That's like golf. You go out golfing and you hit a nice shot, boom, it goes into the hole. You may never repeat that again, but you're going to go out every week and, and do it again. Um, it's the same with spearing. And, and I would say people are often asked, um, you know, of, if you had to give up everything but one thing, I think a lot of people would put spearing at that at the top, you know, rather than to go bow hunting or gun hunting. I mean, it is. There's nothing like it. I mean, uh, me personally, I'll speak for myself. You know, you can shoot a Boone and crack at buck and, you know, you'll get your praise from your guys and stuff like that. And you may have a celebratory drink or two, and then that's it. Uh, you spear a 40 pound sturgeon three days later, you wake up in the drunk tank. You wonder what happened. You know? <laughs> I mean, it can get pretty wild and crazy, but that's, like I said, that's not a reference to the rest of the spearing world out there. That's just me talking. So, uh, but it is, it's addictive. There's nothing I can explain uh, that if you haven't endured and went through it at all and, for me, it's not even about getting a fish. It's just that camaraderie and everything that's involved in it. You've got families, you know, that have gone through it. You've got grandparents, you've got parents, you've got children, soon the grandchildren, you know, you make room for more and more people that are involved in it. And it just, it becomes a whole culture thing. You know, you've got your, you know, same as when you have spring fishing and you see the people at the different tournaments and that, but when you get into the spearing culture, um, it's a whole different thing. And everybody's got their groups, you know, they got their little enclaves and then they celebrate what they do and they celebrate the people in there that, that do the things. And you kind of mark, you know, your years, you know, with that sturgeon spearing experience. So it's, there's always something, there's always a story that evolves out. Somebody did something or something happened or remember when, and it's just, it's a, it's a great, uh, great thing, you know, You've got that solitude of the bow hunting, of the gun hunting. And gun hunting, there's a lot of that family tradition, too. But um, with spearing, it just seems to be a little bit more connected to it. And I think that part of it is just that camaraderie and, and family involved in it. We we do always try to compare it to gun hunting. Like, that's when we try to describe it on the podcast or to other people, whatever. It's Because it's a very local thing. So, it, like, even some people in, in Wisconsin, like, if they're up north or just not right around here, like, some people just have never been a part of it, don't really know what it's all about. So I think you described that perfectly. Like, yeah, you can shoot a deer, but it's just something different if you spear a sturgeon. Like, if you go to, like, any of the restaurants along the lake, you'll just – you'll be amazed at how many people come out to this thing that you didn't even know were around or even enjoyed it, but it, there's just thousands of people that come out for this, which is – crazy to think that everybody wants to go out on the ice with trucks and shanties and look down a hole but like you're saying once you you spear one or even see one is it's a game changer right and i've been pretty pretty spoiled in the luck that i've had in the couple of years that i've been doing it now but for sure like that that first year uh, when jake 
got his and then I went out there and saw a Terry Spear one and then saw a Gabby Spear one. It's like, yeah, you're you're hooked and now it's something I'll be doing forever. So, um, but yeah, you, you touched on it too with the whole uh, camaraderie thing and then, um, you know, there's the stories and things that happen and a good example of that too is these hoodies that we have with our group and the nicknames that everybody gets on the back of the hoodie because they all are derived from a certain story or a certain something that happens during sturgeon spearing. So it's just kind of that um, that interesting atmosphere that's just different from anything else, and it's a, it's a pretty special thing. Um, and you guys, when you got started, it was just you and a couple of buddies, right? Yeah, we, we got started uh, being introduced to the sport and taking part in it, a good friend of mine, Joel Warner, uh, decided to take myself and uh, Tim Shipper along, uh, spearing one season. This was probably 1993, and um, we we got involved in in uh, in that, and and like you guys as well, you know, just the first time not knowing pretty much uh, shit from Shinola, in uh, in spearing and what was all about, and you know, basically, and that was. That was three weeks then. You know, regardless, there was no cap. Um, you fish from sun up to sundown, and uh, <clears throat> that was it. You stared and looked at the hole. You didn't take any time. And in the same token, there wasn't such a rush of, you know, having to be done at the time that we're done now where, you know, you could grill out, you could do different things and stuff like that depending on what was done. But he took us along, and it was just like that. It was, you know... One of the things that we don't see too much, it was gin clear, referring to the reference of the water. I mean, reading a newspaper on the bottom of, of the of the lake or flipping a quarter and you could see heads or tails. I mean, that's how clear it was. I remember distinctly we were out of Wentz and, you know, probably about, uh, you know, 10, 12 feet of water. And um, I could see that sturgeon come through and it was plowing the mud. And the mud was rolling right over the sturgeon's back. And I looked at my buddy and what seemed to be an irregular voice, but I think it was because there might have been something else that was involved in the process that we've been sitting there all day and not realizing how much we had consumed he looked at me i looked at him and he looked at me and said throw so i grabbed the spear down and i threw and i turned and looked and he had thrown only he didn't take the spear off the hook he just ripped the two by four down and speared it and there there we were and then warner come in and says what are you guys doing you know he thought we had screwed around and speared the ground right and, uh down at the bottom of the lake and it was just sitting there because nothing was moving well i'd speared that fish right behind the neck and when i did the the head it swung around and then my buddy pinned it so it was <laughs> stuck in a u and i said no we did it we got it we you know we're bringing it up and everything like that and he's looking at us like that's it and that's how it started he said that's it i'm done with you too you know, you you came in here like two mad wild dogs. You made a rough shot of my whole place, and uh, Spirit of Sturgeon made a mess. Uh, you guys are on your own, <laughs> get your own shack, and then we you know, started that whole process and uh, started adding to our uh, to our shacks. Yeah, knowing that knowing those guys, that story sounds about right. I can picture all of that going down. So the lake always used to be like really really clear. You had you had good years and and bad years. It, it hasn't been, you know, and a lot of it deals with the weather that we have now and um, the snow cover, whether you get snow to cover the ice and the algae bloom and that. But it just seems we we usually had, you know, some years where it was where it was clear. And with that clarity, you know, comes a, a large harvest uh, as well. Um, you know, I remember some some years waiting in line, you know, two three hours. Wow. Uh, waiting in line, you know, and you're pulling your sled and everybody's pulling their sled and it's dark out and you're waiting to register your fish and stuff like that. But yeah, you get those clear years and it was uh, just unbelievable. Uh, kind of like Black Lake, you know, they just finished up. I think it was uh, an hour long. Yeah. Uh, their season for six fish. And but that that lake is always gin clear. I mean, you can see to the bottom and that, you know, that's over our, our lake of 20 feet. They're you know, I think 40 feet or even more uh, in there. And so, uh, you know, those those years are were few and far between, but, but uh, we're more so than we see now as far as clarity is concerned. Because now yeah. there's there's a lot of technology to try and deal with that. Like if, if the, when I speared mine, you couldn't see anything 
but we had enough like you have the camera down there <laughs> now there's pan optics and yeah. all that stuff so i mean if, if it wasn't for cameras just those alone i never would have seen that fish come through the hole because it was just way too murky so i mean it's which has kind of been a trend at least in the last i mean i've been going for what like eight years probably and I can't. I don't think there's ever been a year there that they've hit the cap, and the water just the water yeah. clarity has seemed to get a lot worse. And like you were saying, my dad told me a couple of times, like when way back when they would the season be done after the first weekend or yeah. shortly after, because they were they just hammered them because it was clear, good conditions, and lots of fish. So when did they start implementing like those caps on the on the fish? What kind of brought that about? Well, I there's always been. And I should refrain back from that. There's always always been, you know, some caps in place and things. Ron Brock, uh, the original uh, st- uh, steward of the sturgeon, uh, the biologist, uh, you know, worked hard in, in the preservation. And, and all of the local chapters, sturgeon for tomorrow chapters, have worked hard for the preservation as well. You know, don't get me wrong in some of the stories. I don't mean to belittle the sturgeon or anything like that. These are just... You know, us just talking about uh, spearing and the things that happened. But um, they've done really well on managing uh, the sturgeon population. And we have one of the healthiest sturgeon populations. I mean, at least for myself, I always see more sturgeon than I see walleyes or anything else in the lake. And, you know, we're supposed to be, you know, this amount of number for walleyes and different things like that. But, um, you know, they've always been, been very conscientious about, you know, those caps and those numbers. And in fact, those numbers have been adjusted again this year as, as well. Um, but yeah, Jake is correct. It's been a number of years now that we, we haven't met that, that, that cap or those triggers that are on those. Uh, specifically, I couldn't speak to the exact time in which all of these things were implemented. I should have did my homework a little bit better on that one. Though. That's a tough question. So, and I'm sure somebody will in the comments down there in the podcast as they watch it, they'll they'll correct us as well. And uh, we could probably look it up a little bit later on too as well. But uh, yeah, technology. I mean, when we first started, it was uh, two spears. Now we did have a year. You know, we talk about memorable times and stuff like that. The 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 regs used to read twelve midnight. You know. And then the season would begin. And so that kind of left the door open and, and a few people dabbled in it, but no, nobody really seriously that I, that I knew that I went with. And we had a pretty hardcore crew, East Shore, West Shore. Uh, we had a number of people that we fished with and different groups that, that we knew and I never heard of anybody. But once that changed as far as putting the time frame in and kind of shortening that day as well, um, un- using lights, uh, at night. It was probably one of the most memorable times we had. At 2.30 in the morning, I speared a fish, uh, bought some submergible lights uh, through Cabela's and uh, put them in the water, hooked up a bunch of batteries and series, and, and we had those lights there, and then you could see that illuminated. And nothing more uh, just, you know, like out of this world is to see that figure come through in, in the dark like that. And to see that fish come in in there and, and to spear that uh, in the dark, that was a different, different experience, you know. One that I always uh, will remember, you know, out of, uh, wasn't the biggest one, but uh, it was definitely one of the most memorable opportunities. But that was it for technologies. Basically what we had, you know, you had maybe one of those little lights like you have in the back cap of your truck, you know, a little 12 volt. You turn that on. That was your light in your shack. Yeah, a little burner stove that got you going. None of the high dollar you know, heaters that, that are out there now today, or you had a stove that vented out through the top. And then uh, you had your CB, you know, everybody had a handle, you know, and that was kind of how we originally originated some of our names there. You know, we had to come up with something. And then, uh, so, uh, you know, Shipper and I, you know, ended up, uh, you know, he's Aquaman, I'm the Green Lantern. <laughs> Warner's the devil. That's a story for later <laughs> that uh, hopefully the kids aren't listening. But, uh, and that's how we got started, you know, and we figured, you know, hey, what better way to, to share in our sport than that? And so we created our, you know, the Sturgeon Slayers. Now there, there are other people out there that claim to be Sturgeon Slayers as well, and that's fine. You know, we didn't put a trag mark on it and, and so like that. But, uh, that's it. And every year then uh, we get somebody added. They have to put a year in, you know, sitting out there religiously, you know, uh, trying to vie to get a, a sturgeon. And then uh, the following year we have a little uh, ceremony. And usually they do something, 
you know, that ends up tipping it off. You know, here we kind of like, uh, for lack of a better term, it was a episode of uh, Seinfeld and we, you know, gave ourselves a nickname, so to speak. But then after that, it was always something that somebody did. And then yeah, as that resulted, then they got their, their name on the on the back there. So, you know, Eli Shipper, uh, he dropped a skimmer down the hole, and so hence he became known as Skimmer. And, you know, around that time frame, uh, when you get into Sturgeon's period, everybody loses their real names, and they take on their Sturgeon's period <laughs> names. And then that's how you refer to everybody. But the, going back to it and the technology and that, you know, very limited. You know, there were, you know, it was basically by sight. And if you had those years that, that were murky, um, you know, that's what it was. It was, it was feast or famine, you know, for a while there. And this was before my time, you used to be able to fish out of the hole legally. And that was just other game fish. But eventually on the murky years, I think that was taken advantage of and people hook and lining and stuff like that. And so that was done away with and no longer can you fish out of that sturgeon hole. Uh, with that, you know, you're only limited to what 12 inches uh, right. a hole in diameter to uh, fish out of. But um, yeah, the the CB that was their mode of communication. Cell phones at the time frame weren't, uh, you know, those were things that were just coming along in that and with the plans and that they had out there. So I, you know, some of our shacks we still old school it and with the CB and every once in a while file fire them up and uh, you know do a breaker one nine on the uh, for a radio check. Yeah, Jake's still got one now in the brand new shack. That's all I know. I mean, like ever since I've been doing, everybody's got one in our group. So it's just kind of. I was kind of weird that when I was in your shack, you didn't, you guys didn't have one. I was like, oh, well, you they, were. They just don't want to uh, be listening in by the NSA. You right. Know? They just want to keep it on the deal. They're super secret uh-huh. there. You know, till Eric goes to the bar and tells everybody where he's at. <laughs> then there's all those shacks around him. Well, yours was, Sorry, Eric. <laughs> yours is a symptom of having a tin roof, too. You well, that, too. Yeah, you, I couldn't go on my phone if I wanted to. Yeah. The old Faraday cage. When Terry speared one, he was trying to send a, send, picture. A, send a picture, send a text out. So he's reaching out the door of the shack trying to get some service to go through. But you've mitigated that now. You've got the, the nice rubber roof on there, but you still got the CV. Which is funny because everyone says, like, never leave the door open type thing because you don't want the light in. Yeah. But like all our shacks are all pitch black and stuff. So how I don't get the whole how do you guys see at night when you could spear all night long or whatever that was? Because now it's only seven to one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead. You put the you put the lights in the water. Yeah. Basically. So the light the lights were like uh, sealed test tubes. I still have them too. And if if you fired that up outside of the water, it would burst. Because it, it so generates quite that. a bit bit of heat. Yep. So right. they're made for that. I think uh, in a product environment, the useful legal product environment was for like uh, attracting uh, bait fish to net them, you okay. know, to use for fishing and stuff like that. But that light attractant. Um, so, yeah, they dip down. Now, some people would drill holes outside and put spotlights in there to try to hover down. But these lights went right down. So, yeah, there was an area of darkness outside. Same as when you're fishing and spearing um you know there's an area that you can't see out and uh, that they'll come in from the you know from the shadows so to speak that you can finally see it illuminates a little bit better but uh once that once those were down there um like i said it was like an eerie shadow that came in but um then you were able to see then that next year it was done uh, with that, and the times were were, con- were a little bit more, and they switched from that original time frame, which was like six thirty to twelve thirty, I believe, and then it was, you know, it was dark still, you know that that time frame. So you kind of right. lost that half an hour, and so then they kind of bumped it back there as well. And now people say, how can you sit here for so long? You know, twenty one days, you know, and if you if you had the time to do it and have off uh, every day, all day long from sun up to sundown. I mean, that was a lot of time to put in. That's some serious dedication. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and it's just, um, you know, and as things evolved, and I, there's a lot of controversy over using the different technologies that we have out there and whether or not that it's actually, you know, and I know they've done some surveys, whether or not that's actually improved people's opportunities for harvesting or different things like that. And whether you're wounding, and I mean, you can draw all correlations. You shoot a deer with a gun and you don't recover it, or you shoot a with an archery with a bow and things like that. It's just, you know, I think it's a little bit more near and dear because, you know, these these are prehistoric fish. I mean, when you look at 20 plus years before they come to maturation, before they can spawn, um, and then, you know, did you have yours aged? 
Mine yeah. was like 56, 58. Yeah. Right. You know, which is crazy. Mine would have been a little younger, but yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, 90 pounds for a male. I mean, that's that you're topping out uh, on that one too. So um, it's, it's neat, you know, kind of going back to that story too. And you saying you were fortunate enough. I remember you two with my daughter in a shack and we had a camera down you know, we were just north of the third reef and that. And then I said, oh, look, here comes one. And Noah says, well, what's so big about that, you know? And I'm like, are you kidding me? We what were freaking the, out. We're and... freaking out. He's like, what are you guys getting all wild about? And I said, you know, it's uh, kind of along the line of, uh, you know, 10,000 casts for a muskie. Some guys some guys have been doing this for, for decades and haven't seen a fish yet, you know? Um, and it's that's just the way it goes. And sometimes, you know, the first time they speared, I remember Lana Freiberg, you know, hers was a hundred and plus pounds, you know, you know, every year she waited, I think she added 10 more pounds onto the fish <laughs> that she was going to get. And I remember her the, you know, week weekend before that somebody sat in her seat and whatever, or she gave her seat up and they speared one and she was like, Oh, I can't believe it and the next weekend, you know, but those things happen, you know, there's all those kinds of stories out there and that, but I mean, you know, somebody to me that's really tried and true has never seen one, but they're still out there every day, you know, giving it, putting in the time. Cause there's a lot of work involved, you know, uh, and every year it's the new challenges, you know, this year for us on the West shore, you know, um, by law, there's got to be 12 inches of ice out there in order for them to put bridges and stuff like that. Otherwise, you know, it's a ton of liabilities, you know, right. for clubs and that in the West shore, it just, it's just not going to happen this year. And so with the ice and the way it is, so now you got to finagle a different way of driving around here or there, your UTV or getting across and, being able to put things in, you know, cutting those uh, holes and getting everything done and sinking the cake. And, you know, there's a lot involved in that and getting all set up. And then, you know, if you decide to make a move and you do it all <laughs> over again, and that's, you know, the things that break and the things that, uh, you know, go wrong if they could go wrong and the people that wait and, well, not the people, it's been kind of, you know, hey, it's Super Bowl Sunday, I should probably start working on my sturgeon shack, you know. <laughs> You know, or, uh, hey, I'm going to build one right now. You know, that's always been the joke. You know, I see it on on uh, Sturgeon Spear and Buy, Sell, Trade all the time. They yep. have it on there. Shout out to Brandon Aarons and his crew there and what he does. But, um, you know, it's uh, it's just the nature of the beast. You know, you put off, you got 365 and a quarter days, and it seems like, <laughs> oh, I got a quarter days left. Let's build a shack. Sure. And it's been done. You know, I remember when my first one was Super Bowl Sunday and uh, had one of those cow-catching door latches there. And, it swung shut and I got I uh, had the lock on there <laughs> I got locked in and they're yelling and screaming for the Super Bowl I'm yelling and screaming to try to get out and so it's just uh, you know you always put yourself in those positions and that but at the end of the day you know somebody gets one to me now it's it's about taking people out that haven't been out before they get to see one or they get one you know this this year I hope uh, my wife my youngest uh, Jeb, you know, they haven't experienced uh, that opportunity. They've seen fish, they've had opportunities, but they haven't uh, connected. And, and that keeps them coming back as long as they can see them too. And that's uh, been a, a great opportunity. And you know, it's been one where you get the whole family back in. So our whole family spears, you know, so everybody gets out. It's not, hey, you know, I'm, I'm out here. You know, what, what should I be doing with the family? And then it's like, hey, the whole family's out here. They're helping out. They're involved in the process. And you can make your memories that way. Right. Yeah, it can be rough out there sometimes trying to get shack set up. It always seems like the weather, at least in the past couple of years, has been pretty decent to get them set up initially. But then if you're not seeing fish and people are seeing fish in another spot, all of a sudden word gets around, you got to try and make a move. It seems like every time we try and move, then the weather is just terrible. That last year you speared your your ninety pounder, uh, and uh, I mean it must have been blowing fifty sixty miles an hour. It was a complete whiteout, yeah. and I'm going by GPS and I'm just trying to figure out are we in the right spot here, you know? And and I set the shack down and I'm looking around and looking around. I'm like I don't see anybody, you know. You, you know it's just you know you don't want to set up near anybody, you know anybody that's in a can you can see you might be too close to it i mean like see like 200 yards away or whatever yeah and uh you know we're cutting those shacks in and it was so brutal and then you get one saw that freezes up and you got the other saw in the truck staying warm and you're going back and forth with it and you know and then you get all set up and everything and then boom you speared that one and then it's like you know hey it's all worthwhile yep you know the the hands are cold everything is freezing you know i don't think your heater was working in the beginning 
So I had to go over there, and we, we kind of finagled that and everything. And I'm like, oh, we should have just probably stayed home. We'd have been better <laughs> off. And then, boom, tell you know, we get the wild call, you know, just a split second, and the whole dynamics change. Yep of the uh of your spearing day and that you know and then the light starts to clear and then it starts to look and then you're looking around it's like oh there are people around yeah. here it's like you know it's just uh just uh unbelievable and sometimes it's uh it's even on you can't even put it to words yeah we got started real early that morning and i still don't think we were like fully set up until nine o'clock nine thirty something like that you called me at like ten thirty yeah. ten thirty four i think yeah just happened like that i remember it might have been that morning moving shacks and my truck was still alive at the time so r.i.p uh, r.i.p <laughs> <laughs> so i was pulling one of the shacks and we hit some glare ice and all of a sudden next thing i know i see it coming up right alongside <laughs> me it comes in hits the side of my truck bounces back and we just kept on going extra we zip ties and, yep. and uh and uh metal screws there. Yep. tappers yep I and that's another point you bring up too you know uh now we've got snow out there this year but some years i remember people going to parking lots and shoveling snows onto snowmobile trailers because you need to bank that in on the sides right. there for those of you that may not have uh, been out uh with spearing in that you want to protect those sides keep the wind from blowing in so it doesn't riffle the water so you can you can see and you know i still like to look down the hole i'm you know envious uh of you uh being in that shack when you got those three out of there because i mean i look at that video and i'm like that's that, those were the days of old when you just stared down. i mean you might have the pipes down or something but you see those fish break the pipe or you can see that black line coming across that pipe and then you you know you got kind of a judgment idea and that's great you know i mean it's just uh it just that gets the whole thing going you know the heart pumping and and the adrenaline flowing and i uh you know you were so calm when you speared your sturgeon i thought to myself <laughs> you know he, he dates my daughter and i thought to myself that guy's like an alien or something <laughs> i mean in the video okay he's coming this way here he's about 45 yards out it'll be about 2.5 <laughs> minutes before he gets in here I'm going to grab this spear over here and that. And you can hear my son in the background. Rah, 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 you know, and he's keeping him calm and that. And I'm thinking to myself, that is something else. I mean, that's like a calm, cool, collected veteran. And so, sure enough, comes in there and boom, you know, spears it. And I'm like, holy cow, that's just not right, you know. Then you get the uh, some of the other videos and it's beep, 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 <laughs> you know. And it's just uh, everybody, you know, internalizes it. But I think it's that kind of your mind and how it works, you know. Uh, you know, you got kind of that engineering mind where you can kind of problem solve it. Me that, you know, I, I think I see one and the next thing you know, it's, you know, <laughs> everything breaks loose. So, but it's, that's all a part of it. You know, you got to have fun. Whatever you do, as long as you enjoy what you're doing, that's the most important part. And getting in the outdoors and getting kids involved in the outdoors as well is another big part of it. So, yeah. And I've been really spoiled and I, like to say things to try and push people's buttons because of that that i shouldn't say now i'm probably going to be cursed for years and years but um just spearing on bago you know you're kind of expected to go a good number of years without seeing fish or without spearing fish i mean certainly some and people, now he jinxed himself yeah <laughs> well no i'm just saying i mean some people have better no, luck than others right. and, right. and i think if you are one of those people who digs in when the weather's bad and you make the moves and stay mobile and kind of go where people are seeing fish you increase your chances than if you just go to the same spot you've been going to for 20 years and you just sit there whether there's fish or not but there's certainly an expectation i guess that you're going to go a number of years in between having the opportunity to spear one but if you can put in enough preference points to draw enough river tag that can kind of be a game changer. I know you've had one or two or three. You, you've been up river a couple times, right? Uh, several times. It, it used to be, you know, every five years it opened up. Yeah. And then everybody could go up. Whoever wanted to decide to, to make the trip, you could go up there. And, and, and I, I totally get it. You know, I mean, there are those people that are just, you know, it's kind of like uh, spring fishing. You've got the people that are in the river and you've got the people that are in the lake. And then the river people don't like the lake people come in and the lake people could say, well, you could come to the lake. And, you know, you got that controversy and there's, and, 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 and that's people's prerogative. Uh, some people like to go up river and some people refuse and want to stay in bagel and that's fine. 
The upriver one's a tricky one because, you know, that one you usually only have a couple of days. And then you got to set your goals. What are, you, what are your goals going to be? Is it going to be the first one that comes through the hole? And you spent nine years because uh, this is this will be my ninth year. I thought I was going to draw maybe this year, and that's maybe why I jinxed myself. So this <laughs> I, next, yeah, I heard they're up to like nine now. Yeah, this yeah. next year will be be nine years. And uh, but when you get up there, you know what's what's your goal? Are you willing to walk away? You know, without spearing a sturgeon, even though you're going to see sturgeon, but it doesn't meet that goal. And to me, I take my hat off to uh, people that set that goal, and then in Nine times out of ten, it works out for them, and that. And if, if if it doesn't, you know, you just said, "Hey, I got an opportunity to fish in a fishery that could potentially, uh, you know, net me a hundred pounder plus, and that's my goal uh, to do." Uh, or is you know your goal to to spear a decent fish or wherever it is, you know? And I'm not one to point fingers and who should do what and who shouldn't do what. Um, that's what fulfills you know what what's going to make you happy in in what you do and but that's one of them if that's a big one that you put on your back it's like okay i'm going to hold myself to this and now all of a sudden two days into it and you know maybe you haven't seen a fish you've been seeing fish all the time and now something's changed you haven't seen a fish and now you start to sweat um and then you think to yourself well what, what should i do with my goals you know and and you want to keep to that. And like I said, you know, I take my hat off to those people that hold to those goals. And if they don't acquire them, you know, then, you know, that's it. They move on and they, and they go forward with that. But yeah, uh, spearing up river is, is a pretty neat experience. You get an opportunity to see a different body of water and a whole different clientele of fish. You know, when you get a school of gars that come through and your heart jumps or uh -huh. you get to see a few more northern than you normally would say or those buffalo uh, carp come through in big packs like that and you say to yourself or, or a catfish or two, you know. So it's like more of an aquarium view that you get uh, with it. Um, but it's, you know, there's a lot involved in that in that whole process of, of going up river. So what makes those lakes so much better i mean it's obviously obviously a combination of things right i think it's a little bit more shallow a little bit more clear shallow uh usually that clarity will go with that but if if it's dirty or the dam gets opened up and that you know that dirties things up as well but uh smaller lakes uh if if you got a food source you know whether it be shad you know or red worms and you can target that area in there and then you know it's just like anything else the you know, they're going to go to the feed where they're at and then that smaller area uh, as well. But, you know, those caps have gone, you know, an extended period of time as well, more so than, you know, hey, the trigger's already in, in that first day or second day and then, you know, you're already at that cap uh, trigger point. But uh, that is, and, and the fact that you put the tags in and that, and it's uh, kind of the, for you know, not everybody can go up there, so it gives you an opportunity. But, yeah, it's... you. Typically, you can see a few more fish than you normally would see uh, on Winnebago uh, with that. Your success rate goes up tremendously, if yeah. I'm not mistaken, if you if you can draw from one of those upriver tags. And it's not like a golden ticket, but, I mean, you got a, you got a lot better chance of seeing fish. Like, if I ever, when I draw, I'm probably taking off almost either till the cap's hit or to spear, and that's kind of the mentality of up there. I mean, you're going to wait nine years, so you might as well try and take off as many days as you can because yeah i mean it's it's kind of rare i'd say for the second weekend to get there not not uncommon but like third weekend's probably almost never up yeah, there correct so on the tags you have drawn up river what's been your philosophy on it have you been waiting for like a, a decent size one do you like to spear the first one you see er, you know early on you know we had the luxury of having uh some of of uh what I would call some pretty good sturgeon spearing um, teachers, you know, that uh, that helped us and facilitated us uh, along the way. You know, it's just like anything else. And if you know me, once I get into something, I'm, you know, I just dive right into it. And, you know, this sturgeon spearing just took off and and I, you know, really was was into it and and really enjoyed doing it and connected myself with with some people that uh had done it for years, you know, Howard and Gail Schmitz, I mean, were probably, you know, some of the early ones, you know, Howard used to take, he was a, a retired now, still alive, a great welder. I mean, he would, he would take like the back, 
these back boxes off of trucks like uh you know like big big trucks and then convert them into uh with aluminum runners on there and you'd have you know it'd be like a taj mahal of sturgeon spearing shacks and stuff like that so there was a number of them the cybles from the east shore and stuff like that and in a and a combination of of the west shore people as well and just kind of getting to know all these places and that and you know and and putting putting in your homework and doing different things like that but i just got you know some great people that put me in in good places and we had a nice opportunity it was that that whole culture that we kind of started with you know um uh that was our kind of our first clan uh sturgeon spearing clan that we ran with and um it was great to to be part of that to see everything that went on i mean you know they would roast the pig you know the weekend before it would have been this last weekend you know out there big sparn farkle kind of kicking everything off and everybody getting together and the the laughs you would see and the joking and you know always getting on one of the guys in there about you know hey where are you working now and what are you doing <laughs> here and you know did you shut the last place down and so and, and we've lost a lot of those guys you know over the years and that and that's sad you know and uh you know, you think about that when you're out there and the people that you spent a lot of time with and those that aren't any, you know, with you any longer because sometimes spearing was the only time that you spent together and it, it made it memorable and those moments were, were uh, you know, they were precious, not to sound kind of weird, but uh, they were and they still are. And, uh, but, you know, just, I, you know, the, here's the deal. Every time my partner and Tim and I uh, fished together for many years and, um, Every time he left the shack, it became a joke. Uh, in fact, after a while, he would just say, I know you're going to spear one, so I'm just going to get up right now. I'm going to walk out the shack, and uh, I'm going to put myself out there so you can spear one. And nine times out of ten, he was usually correct. <laughs> um, you know, uh, somebody would be calling, hey, on the, on, the, on the CB, we've got some chili over here. Or uh, Bootsy made this. That was, that was Gail's uh, nickname. Uh, Bootsy, she would make this great dip, and so I gotta go get some dip, you know. So he walk out the door, and, and all of a sudden I'd start yelling. He's like, "What?" He goes, "Did you do it again?" You know, and boom, I would spear a sturgeon, and it was it was always a joke uh, around there. Hey, why don't you leave so I can spear a sturgeon? So one year I I felt badly about it, and I just vowed, you know, because he always get gave me the first shot, you know, it was my shack and spears and everything like that, and and I said, uh, this year, Tim. You're going to, you're, I'm putting you in the hot seat. That's it. You're going to do it. This is the way it's going to go. I'm not, you know, and I'm, and I'm just sitting back and we're just looking and stuff like that. And we happen to be on the East shore on this one here out of pipe. And, uh, <clears throat> he got up to, to go outside or something to go to the bathroom or whatever. And I looked at out the door, you know, as, as he was closing the door and I turn around and she's just laying right in there. Oh my gosh. You know, 10 feet down. <laughs> and it was just like, you know, and I just, yeah, you could probably badmouth me and say you weren't a good person. I wasn't even thinking. I mean, that spear was off the hook and it was down. Oh, yeah. Rightfully so. Yeah. Uh, 90 pounds, uh, female, you know, F4 and everything. And all of a sudden he came back and he goes, what did you do? <laughs> I said, I think I speared your sturgeon. <laughs> and I felt badly uh, about it and that. And, and you know, we uh, I pushed him and pushed him. And then, uh, and then he... Uh, I said, hey, you, you got you, your kids are getting bigger. You got kids that want to be involved in it. And by this time, I had procured another shack and built another shack and that. And, you know, just trying to make room for people coming around there. And then uh, Tim Tim ended up getting a, a, a shack. And, uh, I mean, he, he broke it wide open. You know? <laughs> he did. He speared one. His wife speared one. And I'm like, buddy, see what happens when you get your <laughs> uh -huh. stuff and that. And so... I mean, he's hooked with it uh, in it, but I mean, there's all kinds of stories like that that you, you that you you're gonna you're gonna hear. There's always sturgeon stories. He's in. Go ahead, Jake. I was just gonna say, so is ninety pounds your biggest one, or yeah, ninety pounds is my biggest one. I had a bunch. I have some in the seventies, and the sixties, and the fifties. I have not yet uh, broke that hundred, and in in large part too because. Uh, you know, there are people I know out there that will pass up a 70 pounder. They'll pass up an 80 pounder. I mean, they'll even look at it too. And I mean, <laughs> I won't name any names in that, but I remember, I think it was like 98.6. He was called for a long time because, you know, he wanted a hundred pounder and I'm thinking of like 98.6. That's awesome. You know, you're, right. you're not too far off the mark, but he was disappointing himself. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I honor that. 
Um, you know, and it wasn't anything that, uh, you know, uh, well, he should be happy for what he got. It was, he had set standards and that's what he wanted to do. And, and he thought he had judged it correctly. And it's, it's tough, you know, it's like sitting up in a, in a, in a stand and you see a bear come in and you're trying to size that bear up because you, you know, you see a buck, you can see it's rack, you can see that and you understand, you know, but when you look at a bear in a distance, you're trying to figure out where you're at. You're at again, nine years, you pulled the tag and now it's like, Oh my God, here comes a bear. Is it big enough? Is it not big enough? How big was that stump? You know? And then, you know, you don't want ground shrinkage and the same thing, you know, when you get a fish coming through and illuminating it in that water, you know, and you got to judge and people put decoys out to give them some type of perspective, but you know, there'll be people that'll pass those fish up and, um, you know, waiting for a bigger one. And then they usually do spear the bigger ones. How do you spear a bigger one? You don't spear the smaller ones. Unfortunately, sometimes for me, I see that 72 pounder come through and, and, <laughs> and, you know, or 60 some pounder or 50 some pounder come through and, you know, it's, it's hard not to, you know, you get excited. And, um, so maybe I need a little bit more discipline. I don't know if it's no, legal. I, would, I think yeah. you just take it, man. I mean, those are all solid fish. Right. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. And I know you brought bears up on, on purpose because you, <laughs> yeah, kn- cause you I, I know did. I don't want to yeah. shoot a bear. That was for Joel Warner. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be another guy that'll listen to the podcast. Uh-huh. So uh, what are your thoughts on caviar? I love it. I love it. I love it. I just, uh, you know, I just, um, people have been, you know, doing uh, caviar uh, for years and we've had a, a group on the east shore and a group on the west shore and and all of that um i just i don't feel that there was any malfeasance involved in that whole process um you know and i'm fine with with paying them to process my my stuff um i i do believe a lot of it gets wasted because you know not everybody's gonna eat all those eggs you know that they right. get now and it wasn't like they were selling anything like that i don't want to get into all that controversy and that but um, I do. It's an acquired taste, but I, I do. I mean, uh, that year that Gabby speared hers, it was full of eggs. And I mean, uh, it was a, that was a lot of jars we ended up getting back and it was, uh, I put it on everything. It's, uh, I, you know, I can just, I can spoon it right out and just eat it raw too as well. And I've had it raw right, right there as it's hanging on the hook too. And sometimes you prefer that over the, with the, um, uh, Salt and everything added to it, and that. But like I said, it is a it is an acquired uh, taste. I don't know, man. I I do know that you enjoy caviar. I remember you would bring it to school when Gabby speared that one. It was like you'd bring it for it lunch, lunch, and it's <laughs> caviar. caviar on Ritz crackers, and it's just. Have you had it yet? Caviar and eggs. I don't think I have. Oh, I don't think so. Because um, mine didn't have any, obviously, being a male. It's kind of like if you threw some Orbeez in your mouth. Yeah, that's what I've heard. But not a taste of an Orbeez. I've never had one, but just, just like, like salt. I mean, Orbeez. they don't taste bad at all. It's just the the balls that are rolling around right. in your mouth gets a little, <laughs> messes with the head a little no, bit. I'm not even going to touch uh, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, w- that, that, that was a softball, buddy. I don't know if you can. <laughs> I just knocked that one out of the park. Yeah. <laughs> don't throw any more of those yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked a little oh. bit about some of the traditions and things that go on with sturgeon spearing. Is there anything, like any traditions that we have now that really stick out in your mind that you look forward to every year? Specifically? Yeah, I just, uh, your blue tickets, you know, you, you got your <laughs> blue tickets, you know. Well, you got to explain that. So we we started a number of years ago and uh, I'm pretty sure alcohol was involved in the process <laughs> and that. Could have just uh, scooped up a bunch of trinkets that I had kind of laying around there. You know, one just happened to be a harpoon spear and a couple <laughs> of other things there. When I went down to get one of the new shotguns, my wife shut me down. But I found a roll of b- blue tickets, you know, like tickets you would have a raffle with. And I handed out tickets to everybody that didn't pay any money and then uh, started drawing the tickets out of the, out of the hat. And somebody won a prize. And I, here's the prize. And then I would hand it out. I had some old uh you know line caster poles and stuff like that and and uh you know it just evolved from there and every year the blue tickets got bigger and bigger and we have a little we have a party on on uh saturday night of opening it's kind of like opening a deer hunting you know after opening of deer hunting or opening of sturgeon spearing there is no more opening 
it's already open right you know so we kind of kick it off that way and and since it's we're done at 12 30 you know you hit your local establishments around there support your local people yeah uh that are out there because you know the the, the seasons impact them greatly i mean we're talking you know thousands and thousands of dollars you know that that they get an opportunity to recoup i mean they've been hit hard before that you know with covid and everything else um, and it's tough running those businesses and that. So always support your local businesses, you know, and then they, we would come back to our place closer to home, be a little bit more responsible. In fact, uh, we end up, uh, housing, you know, several of our, of our Sturgeon clan, they sleep over, uh, overnight. So we got everybody there and we can get everybody rallied in the morning and, uh, make them <laughs> breakfast and get them going. So started the blue tickets and that's been going on uh for a number of years now i think five six years and and now it's just uh i ask people you know to dig deep in their coffers and it's not a white elephant i mean we've had you know milwaukee tools um uh we've you know sturgeon spears gaffs uh strainers um skimmers i should say um all kinds of stuff you name it uh all kinds of garb stuff that people donate um, we got the, those little uh, stainless steel spears Travis Hughes does every year and makes for us a little drink mixer, but it's like a sturgeon spears. Um, uh, this year we got a, uh, some uh, cutout. Uh, Muses Sheet Metals is doing some sturgeon cutouts for us as well. Uh, some things that Wentz on the Lake is donating to us as well. And so we end up with a lot of things and then I'll, uh, you know, put up the items of what they are and blue tickets and I'll call off the tickets. Last year I got stuck on three, three, three. <laughs> that was the, that was the number the tickets started off with. And I love seeing people jump up and down. They won something, you know, and we try to try to make it out, you know, so everybody gets something and it's a good time. And, uh, you know, and then uh, we have a bunch of food that we bring and kind of potluck things. And, you know, it's all part of it. And the stories, you know, that go on, things that happen, wrestling suits that get put on and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, never, still, you still, never know. Still therapy on that one, but uh, <laughs> all kinds of things. You know, and, we, and we, we, we got some old timers that come with us too in that, Bill McAloon. I mean, Bill McAloon, uh, he's been spearing since he's been driving around in his old Nash um, you know, uh, car and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, up in Menasha and stuff like that, you know, you know, he's had some stories over the years, you know, that, you know, how he was made was, you know, his dad might've been uh, fishing for sturgeon and may or may not have been legal at the time. And the DNR was looking for him. So he, he went up North uh, to the CC camps and hit out there and met his wife and and got married and then bill macklin was was born he was born on a sturgeon blood <laughs> I, I, you know and, and he had the sturge, sturgeon license plates and uh big willie as i refer to him um uh, made decoys and stuff like that in fact one of my best decoys i got i call a little confidence decoy he made and uh and we had fish come right up to uh right up to that many a times and Big Willie's been spearing for uh, for years. You know, I'm going to probably put it at, uh, you know, 60 years of spearing, and he's had a, 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 a hardcore crew, too. Um, I remember and just going off on a tangent story. He had a buddy, I won't say the name, and um, he fell asleep and bumped his spear, and he fell in the water, and he got, he's got speared oh my god uh, right in the face and got pinned down and he had to pull that spear out and he got up to the top and he had to wrap himself around because he didn't want uh you know his family to find him there and uh he the door had been open and some guy had seen you know what's what's his door doing open and got over there and found him uh they had to flight him out of there and i oh met i god. met him i got to meet him and and he told me that story too and i believe that story is in that book um with it you know where they did the recap of the history of sturgeon spearing that story is in there but uh just all kinds of things you know and that's always you know you want to be safe when you're out there and it does get kind of kind of if you're by yourself kind of quiet and then you start to nod off a little bit you know but safety is the most important part but all those uh stories are out there but big willie um you know i'm, I'm hoping to see him again this year he makes a a, a voyage uh, back, you know, um, and, uh, to spear every year. And so it's just neat. And to hear those stories, you know, um, I remember, uh, Donnie Steffes, uh, my wife's, uh, step grandpa, 
um, when you used to be able to go out and buy tags and then you could spear a sturgeon and get another tag and spear another sturgeon, you know, at the time frame, no regulation on it. So there's all those histories out there, you know, that you can hear and listen to and how things evolved and have changed. And, and now today you, you get in and some of those shacks, they lower on their own now, you uh-huh. know, and you get in and it's like you're, you know, you're in your own home now. Right. You know, it's, uh, you're not really roughing it. And there's a, you know, everything's all done inside and the decor is just so, and so uh, it gets pretty elaborate out there and, and, um, and, you know, people invest in, in what they enjoy. And, and some people might say, well, it's not a prudent investment that you only got a couple of months or a couple of weeks to do it. But it's when you're out there, you want to, you want to do it right. Yeah. You know, you want to enjoy your time. Yeah. They can get pretty cozy. The one we built when I was in school, it had tongue and groove pine all the way up. It was stained all nice. And that one was, we built four uh, this year. Uh, The construction class built four of them this year. I think the kids were about ready to mutiny on me on the the last (laughs) one. I was as well. It gets a little old after a while, but it's, it's nice. It's a, it's a great opportunity. Sturgeon for tomorrow has been very good to us. And if we can pay back to them, uh, as well, it's good, and we always build a shack for them. And you always see a lot of positive comments. Sometimes you can get lost in social media with the negativity, but when you got the kids involved in doing stuff like that, it's always been really positive, and I really enjoy that. So you mentioned uh, one of the blue ticket items can be a, a skimmer. Have you ever gotten in trouble for a particular skimmer that you made? Or? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So my father-in-law decides, you know, he's a big golfer and stuff like that. Not much of an outdoorsman in that. And he decides that he wants to come along and and see all the spear and stuff. And I think he was with was he with you and Gabby? I don't know. Yeah, he. I think he might have been. He might. Yeah, been. he came out. I think during the week, wasn't yep, it? Yeah. Yep, yep. So uh, you know, I was at school and that he came out during the week and that and he's looking around at the skimmer and he's like, Hey, that's the golf club I've been looking for all this time. <laughs> you know, here I had taken a bunch of golf clubs from the basement, not knowing that he had given some clubs to the boys, but in return he wanted those back. So I just I just quick heated up the the head and took the head of the club off and then turned it into a skimmer. <laughs> He's like, that's the that's the club I've been looking for. I've been asking for. I'm like, oh boy. Well, I'd cut that one down. I had to go on eBay and then find the new shaft for him. And I ordered it, and then he was able to put it back together. So this year he gave me some handles that I can make some more skimmers <laughs> Very uh, nice. out uh, as well. Yeah, it makes for a good skimmer. It does. It really does. It, it made for a good story too as well. Uh huh. Yeah. So what are what are some of the most like memorable spearing experiences that you've had i know we've covered a couple of them are there any other ones you can think of that probably hands down i mean uh one year i think we had like 20 fish come through the hole holy cow uh, that we saw you know just i mean to the point it used to be your patron's license got you a sturgeon spear license now you buy that license outside of the patron's license and it has to be procured before october 31st and you know, the reminders fly around during Halloween time, like trick or treat candy. And still it, it happens from time to time that you, that you do relapse and, and forget that. Cause you got, you know, things going on in that. But, um, we, we came in and we sat down and, and we, we got there late. I remember I had an old Honda 250, uh, three wheeler. So I'm, I'm on the three wheeler and, and uh, it's like that, uh, old, I think it was Guinness Book of World Records. He had the world's largest twins, and they were both on mini bikes. So that was like <laughs> me on that three wheeler was like a clown car. And then Shipper was being pulled in the sled. And we were we were we were late. It was already er, it was already light. And as we're going out, I mean, there's fish flopping everywhere on the ice, and and he's just yelling and screaming, "We're late! We're late! We're late!" We get in the shack, we get all set up and everything like that. And it, I mean, it wasn't like you know, boom, boom, boom. You know, and it was, uh, you know, we had some fish and that. And and uh, and then our buddy Joel Warner, he was close by. And, and I said, uh, hey, uh, you know, we we got a fish, um, you know, and Shipper was in the hot seat yet. And, and uh, no sooner am I saying, you know, hey, Shipper's in the hot seat. And all of a sudden the spear goes flying and, and he's got one. And so we take it out. Now, now we can't be in the shack, you know, because right. uh, our tags are filled. And so... You know, just calling around at the time, and and probably the reason why some of that uh, got. But we had, these guys were out spearing already, and you know, you call in your buddy and that. But 
I think all said and done, about 20 had, had rolled through that whole uh, scene, you know, and, and it's just uncommon. I know there's other stories out there, too, that are just similar to that one, uh, uncharacteristic. The only thing we have never done is speared a sturgeon at the same time. <laughs> you know, like when you double up on right. something, you know, bow hunting, you and your buddy might double up on a and both get a deer that night, maybe even on the same property, um, you know, but... To spear a sturgeon through, and I'm sure there are stories out there. Maybe people in the comments will see that. Maybe they'll say, "Hey, you know, um, you know, we did that one time." But there's all those, all those different stories. Or maybe, and I don't know if somebody's got one out there. They could throw that in the comments too. Is uh, have you ever speared a sturgeon with another spearhead in it, or something like that, or have been speared before? You know, that head is is tough, and people will, you know, if they spear that head, that boom ricochets right off of that. Uh, off of that skull there on that on that fish but there's all kinds of stories i mean i've got a myriad of cell phones down at the bottom of lake i lost two in one weekend <laughs> mine and then my wife's oh, don't man. even you know they bounce when those things hit the floor of that shack they'll bounce and they hit the water then they hover there for a second just about when you're ready to grab your net they're right down there <laughs> um so yeah um I left Shipper in there one day and then uh, came back and I had a spearhead, no handle. Where did that go? I don't know. And I was like, what do you mean you don't know? Well, I was practicing on the decoy and I lost the handle. You know, and I'm okay. So then you got to call up Mike Hilbert. Hey, I need a new handle. Why? What happened? I said, he lost it. I said, I don't know where it is. So there's a lot, there's a lot of things that decoys go down there and stuff like that. And that's a whole other thing you can get into. The art of making decoys and what what do you put down there? I mean, we've had everything down there. You know, I coached at Sabish, he coached at Woodworth. We had football helmets facing each other, <laughs> toilet bowl seats, everything. Now it's just now there's some secret stuff out there. But you know, everybody you know does the white coffee cup or different things like that and they keep it simple. But there's some other tricks and trade out there. Some people use the big glass jars filled full of minnows on the inside there. They can dance around there. Which was cool because we had perch a couple times just right. banging on the glass. But so, what's the go-to, or do you just always switch it up um, for decoys? Go-to for decoys. Uh, you know, I I like the little Big Willie uh, confidence one that we keep down there, but um, uh, Big K makes some great decoys. We keep those uh, on hand on a regular basis. The coffee cup seems to be you know if you're camera fishing, you got that coffee cup down there is always a good one uh, as well. We got a couple of new things this year. Let's say we're bringing back the 70s. <laughs> uh, we're going to see how it goes. So Christmas presents, too, yep, for the kids. Yep, you know, they yep. get sturgeon spearing Christmas presents. So do they work, or is it all just to make yourself feel better? I think it's a, I think it's a combination of it's a curious fish. Right. You know, to come up and see what's going on. You know, the, you know and the one thing, too, is, you know, um, you know, when they come in, it may be slow and lethargic, but if something happens, and like you said, I've seen it where the door opens or the floor creaks, and I mean, it is, it's like a turkey. You know, you look at a turkey and you think to yourself, oh, then all of a sudden that turkey takes off and starts snapping off trees four inches on the <laughs> on, on the base <laughs> and just takes off and come eight or high water, it's gone. And I mean, those sturgeon are no different. I mean, boom, and gone just like that. It's like, what? I, you know, I just, all I did was flinch or that. And then there are some times where you can yell and scream, and it and just depends. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it can be. It can be a lot of, what you believe works. Mm -hmm. It's like anything else when you go out hunting. What's your go-to? You know, Colby's got his special bag that he's got all his stuff in there. I'm sure if he's missing something, he probably feels that he's not prepared right and then that kind of carries over into and might bleed over into well the night didn't go well because of this and as long as you got your go-to stuff and everything your mojo if you will uh -huh. um you know i think you can you can believe anything is going to happen but i think sometimes it's just curious and they might come up to see what it is or uh, you know you just got that you're on that line and where they're passing through so what is the go-to Sturgeon spearing snack, or you can pick a couple. for for <laughs> for us for us in the beginning it was uh, it was and I just uh, and he'll slay me if I can't remember it uh, it was a particular type of cookie that we had 
that we always ate and it was it was an off brand it was an off brand type not like a chocolate chip cookie or anything like that uh macaroons there it is <laughs> oh macaroons gotcha. those were the go-to ones we had a we had to bust out the macaroons and that's that's when you were just you didn't give the sturgeon a chance mm-hmm. when you when you busted open the the package of of macaroons i think they were ripping good cookies at the time but macaroons and you start biting into those, you just you had one hand on the spear. You were ready to go. The other guy had the gaff and you're ready to go. Or I just told Shipper to walk out the back door. <laughs> yeah. And that was go time too. That was go time. Pretty much anything. Um, you know, and it's just uh, un- you know, we live in Wisconsin, you know, what I what I say can and will be held against me in a court of law, but let's just face it too, a nice uh, bloody Mary in the morning to to start the day off right uh, as well. Um and and uh and the day carries away all kinds of stuff though everything and anything uh that you can do i mean my first shack i had a bar in there with a griddle and a grill and and then i would (laughs) i would cook on there so i'd make a and this was all day long you know you had from sun up till sundown as long as somebody's watching the hole i'm cooking you know eggs and that then i would deliver to the other shacks and stuff like that so just you know all that kind of stuff uh, that that went on during the uh, the spearing season, but uh, yeah, everybody's got their go to stuff and and different things you know and trying to find different uh, different attractants too that might yeah. bring in uh, fish and that you know the old days you could you could throw anything down so potato peels were a big thing eggshells were a big thing you know to blanket that bottom white so you get a contrast of a fish going over the top now today whatever you put down you got to bring back up yeah and so uh you know those those days of any trinkets down there are different but uh in the same token yeah Pretty much everything that you can find that's unhealthy that has a lot of preservatives is usually good <laughs> in a sturgeon shack. So obviously there's a lot of um, like nostalgia from some of the earlier years where you could sit out there all day and you had a griddle in your shack. Would you say you prefer those days over like nowadays the way things are? Is it just kind of, you know, both of them are good in their own ways? Is today better for some reason? Um, you know, at least, you know, when your time is up, you know, on that yeah. one, I think in some of them, it was, you know, if you don't put the time in, you know, you kind of feel like you, 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 uh, let, let the sport down or you let yourself down, you know, if you, if you quit early and stuff like that. Um, I like the caps. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying get rid of the caps or anything like that, but they, it's just tough to have caps and to do an all day thing. Cause if you have a year that you're really, they really get hit hard by the time that day is over, <laughs> excuse me, it could, it could be tat tatamount to the, to the right. population yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, of the uh, sturgeon. But in the same token, um, you know, as you get older too, um, the shorter days are fine as well uh, with it. You know, and it, it gives you an opportunity too, if you want to regroup and you want to make a move that day or scout some new water, you can do that, uh, as well. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, you know, I don't want to use the term, the good old days. It just was, it was different. Right. And that's what we did. And that's how we did it. And just as now today, a lot of you guys getting started in this season, this is what you know and how you know it. Now things could change in the future and that, and you would refer to those as, as you know, we used to do it this way or this was the good old days, but, um, it's, I like it. I like the sport. I want to continue in sturgeon spearing, um, you know, and and keeping that going, I think, uh, is in part of all the clubs that do everything they can do um, uh, to, to keep that preservation going uh, for, for new habitat, for us as spears as well, and the contributions that we make to these organizations and supporting them. And in the same token, too, is just being stewards on our own. Uh, as well. I mean, it's been a number of years since I've, I've speared a sturgeon. I've had opportunities for getting other people in places. And for me, that's, that's my goal. You know, I, you know, and you know, my name goes, Hey, why don't you spear a sturgeon in that or whatever? I said, well, give, give these other young people an opportunity. Cause what it, what it amounts to is once you see one or you get an opportunity or you, you do happen to harvest one, I mean, that's it. You're hooked for life. I mean, you know, that, and that's part of that, uh, of of that and and as a role taken on now and that's that's where I like to see myself 
you know, as we, as we move forward, um, just continuing on. So, um, yeah. So hopefully with the, the amount of shacks that we have now, <laughs> I can finally sit back down and, uh, and, and rest and, and get rocking and rolling again. I saw the other day you had them all out in the driveway. There's quite the arsenal there. Yeah, it's an armada <laughs> now. I think when you get up to four, it's an armada. So uh, the last one, uh, we just we got done a while ago and got, uh, got all put together in that. And uh, so uh, we're ready to go. New tires on all of them. So Ooh, better tires than on some of my vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I keep them indoors. I used to store them outside, and, and I don't do that any longer because that out during the summer months, you know, and just, you know, Mother Nature is just uh, rough on everything. And so um, we, we keep them indoors. And uh, one of them, two of them uh, have been a total tear down, a grind, uh, you know, repaint the frame and a rebuild you know, on those, and that's the, the longevity of those frames as, as well, you know, and that's come a long way too. in in, in different things there. Um, but you know, the things get more and more expensive, you know, as prices of materials and everything go up. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you get an opportunity and you have those availability, but storing them and putting them away is the, the best way to preserve them for a lifetime. So, Speaking of, just speaking of like uh, frames and stuff, did you ever have any on runners where you had to trailer them wherever you went? And then, like nowadays, you can get them to where they just got wheels. You hook on like a trailer and pull it and go. But did you ever have the runners where you had to trailer it to the lake and then yeah. you could pull it? Yeah, and then we had had some on runners, and then then you had to get them all the way to Poygan and then bring them back. And then you would have guys, you know, with their big trailers, and you would crank them all on and do them that way. And then that could be a little cumbersome. Um, from time to time, if you get a heavy snow one night and you live in a close proximity to the lake and you just run those right down the <laughs> right down the road and get them on the lake, it's just usually when the season's over. And that's something that's changed a little bit too. I mean, these last uh, several years, you know, um, you know, we we always have this, and it's been it's been for a while now. Where you know, are we going to have spearing? Are we going to have spearing? You know, and you know, and Mother Nature always cooperates, and you know, the lake um, it heals up, and as long as you're using your wits this year, and depending on how you want to travel, and that's that's your prerogative. But you know, uh, staying safe out there. Um, but it just it seems like you know, right after spearing is over, that's like it. The lake goes, you know, and it's just you mm -hmm. know, the the water starts to trickle and things start to move. So bringing them back, that's a different story. Then you, then you're trailering them and stuff like that. But yeah. They're still out there, runners out there. You know, Wentz keeps a, a cadre of them up on that on the island up there. They store them, and I think for like twenty five bucks for the year, uh, they can stay up there. And then they pull them off and and get them ready for you for the season if you want to bring them out. But um, having them on wheels is great. Being able to uh, take them from place to place. And I know there's been groups. I haven't done it. Um, you know, I'm I'm now the high school ice fishing coach and. That's not an excuse for anything, but, you know, we always have meets. But, like, this last weekend was Black Lake. I know um, there's been people from Fond du Lac that have, have driven their shacks to Michigan and uh, have speared and then driven them back. Um, you know, it's a lot of miles to put on a shack, you know, oh, yeah. something that you make. Mm -hmm. A lot of them now that, uh, that are made, and I, I say professionally made, I mean, you know, with the suspensions on them and stuff, yeah. now they're, uh, they're able to do it. And when I mean professionally in quotes, it's not, you're not in your garage, you know, welding it yourself. It's, you know, somebody that, you know, whether it be a bow frame uh, for it or a Birschbach frame or, you know, anybody else that's uh, in that, in that business that they professionally weld uh, for a living in that, um, you know, those, those shacks um, can roll any place you want to roll with them. You got your proper signal lights on there and everything like that. Um, you can go anything, any place, anywhere. Some people uh, like to uh, explore and use their their sturgeon spearing um, shack during the summertime. Then it's a shamper. Okay? Mm. It's your sturgeon <laughs> spearing camper. It's a shamper. I know. Uh, I know. Tex. Uh, he uses his camper for um, his his sturgeon spearing uh, shack for uh, his his hunting cabin uh, okay. when he gets out to do some. Uh, you know, in the rut and stuff like that. And he'll have his, I believe, Sky is his dog's name. And then he'll show pictures in there and he'll be cooking in the morning there. Tex Dempsey, shout out to him. So, yeah, look at all the people yeah. I'm going to get in your podcast. You are. Yep. I'm going to link uh -huh. all these people when we're done and get them going. Well, there's there's a whole culture and a whole community. I love watching on 
on Facebook, the things that they do, the techniques they do, and how they do things. You know, you always pick something up from somebody um, and what's happening and see all the neat stuff they do. So, yeah, uh, Jim Price, I know he uses his, he's got a camper camper now, but for many years um, he used that camper. And I'm sure there's people that took their uh, surgeon's parent shacks to Kusa too, you know, well, and that's yeah, a whole other see, thing. I could see Yeah, it. that's the, that's the, that's the, the the scusa, the sturgeon, <laughs> sturgeon. I suppose there's yeah. worse uh, worse things you could be camping out in. You know, you get yourself a little cot in there, and yeah. you could be doing all right. You got the heater as long as you got enough propane, and I guess in the summertime you're you need air. Yeah, maybe you got some windows in there to. Well, and all of them have inverters in now, and you can run a generator on the outside of them too. So. You could probably kick something in there like a fan, and right. a lot of people use those camper doors now. You could put the screen back in there if that was still part of that deal, and and do it that way. So, but yeah, it's just all all kinds of things, you know. Just you know, always making sure you got proper ventilation. That's one of the big, you know, I guess your public service announcement. You know, propane is is one of those where. Um, you know, some of the newer ones now ha- ha- can sense that and they'll shut off. Yep. Um, what's that guy's name? Schick Outdoors. And I've watched him a number of times uh, fishing up, up in Canada. And uh, he's got that propane. He talks about, you know, when he wakes up in the morning, he's got kind of that, you know, th- his sore throat and that, you know, that propane in there. And there are, uh, you know, vents that you can, that you have open and in, in your shacks as well and that. But, uh, you know, for the most part, that's good. You know, just one of my greatest fears is, is you know, coming coming to your shack the next day. One, it's gone. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember moving <laughs> it the night before. Uh, never to be found again. <laughs> or or two, uh, the frame is there, but everything else is charred around it. You know, um, so that's that always can be a danger of leaving that uh, heater on o- overnight uh, in that situation. You want to keep your ice hole open in that, but... Sometimes if you just usually keep that pilot light on, and everything is so well insulated now uh, as well um, with them, but um, some of those things uh, do happen. Yeah, we've done all right just leaving the pilot light on, and then sometimes you have to just break up a little bit on the surface, but usually it's not too bad. Yeah, I know you, a lot of people don't like having like any little chunks of ice around the hole. You want it to be like perfectly clean, perfectly open. Some people can get really bothered by having like any little chunk of ice around probably. and there's always the debate too now of uh you know do you bevel it does that scare the fish away you know as people begin to use more and more technology you know like uh, any one of the live view live scope pan optics whatever yeah. you want to call them um they'll see fish all around their holes and they're they're scanning and they see the fish and the fish are getting near the hole and when they're almost to the hole they see them turn away and now it starts to drive people nuts where, you know, back in the day when I lived my simple life, it'd be like, I didn't see anything today. <laughs> didn't even know they were there. I didn't even know they were there. And now people know they're there and now they're wondering why. Should we bevel the ice? Should we not bevel the ice? Um, is it the decoy? Is it the device, the the clicking of the sonar that they hear or whatever? Oh, yeah. could be a myriad of different reasons. Too many decoys down uh, with it. Um you know, it's just, it's just, it is what it is. Sometimes they come sailing through and sometimes they don't. But now that you can see them coming to you and they don't, then you're wondering, you know, did I, did I shower this morning or, <laughs> or what? what? But, uh, yeah, so that's that's now a topic of what, what's causing these fish to shy away. You know, is it the electronics? Is it not the electronics? You know, well, I heard so-and-so had it, electronics down and they all came in, you know, so. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know if that makes it better or worse mentally if you have something like that where you can see a bunch of fish that aren't coming in, or if you just don't have that and then you see nothing. I suppose it's nice to be able to say that you at least saw something on your panoptics or you know whatever you're using. But I, I guess that could also be demoralizing in some ways and confusing trying to figure out why they're not coming in when you know they're just all around. But there, it's a good tool for scouting too. I mean, it helps you kind of see what's going to be in an area and give you a little bit better idea for that sort of thing, right? Yep. We were able to uh, get out. We had Saturday. We had a, a high school fishing uh, tournament. We hosted uh, the Pika Palooza, and then um, we ended up uh, scouting on Sunday. And I picked up a few. 
uh, in com- some of the different spots. And you like, I got old haunts. Everybody's got old haunts. Yep. They're old go to places. Your graph is marked uh, Spearing 09, 11, 12 here. Uh, cousin Betty, Aunt Ruth, or Jimmy <laughs> or Bobby, they speared one here. He got two out of that one. And, and you go back to the that area there, you know, and, and for a long time, you know, um, you know, the feeding off the bottom, but the, the, they'll feed in the hard pan too. You know, they'll get up on that or in those transitions as well, uh, way up shallow, uh, way down deep, um, you know, but it, and once again, it goes along with those decoys and everything else. What, what you feel comfortable with and what you what you feel is going to work um you know gets all of that kind of right in the right place and and when you do see a fish or somebody gets a fish near you kind of validates that as well so everybody always checks out their old spots and that and you know if you got a network of people you work with and and they're you know forthright with you and you can share some information as well that can help out uh, in in the long run uh, it's it's a lot of lake out there, you know, for you to be able to take a look at. And, um, you know, even though when we get to that population, you know, I would still say it's going to be as, as big as it's it's been. But, you know, there might be some apprehension. I know the East Shore, they're driving off. Those bridges are out and ready to rock and roll. So, And there may be even people that decide to travel all the way around with those wheeled checks and then go that way as well. But um, it gets to be quite the little city out there in the different areas and, the little enclaves, you know, all the way up, up north, you know, up to High Cliff and all the way down south, you know, down to uh, the lighthouse, you know. Yeah. Um, I I ha- I don't know, and somebody might be able to clarify this too. Uh, um, I'm just waiting for the day I see somebody with a shack in the big hole. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be pretty wild. I mean, we've been pretty, do- we've been down pretty close and pretty tight, but not, yeah. not in the big hole, right? You know, right in there. That'd be kind of wild to put a shack in there. And I'm sure there's fish in there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, we've covered quite a few topics, pretty much everything short of sharing where all the hot spots are. So I don't really <laughs> By wanna... the way, if you do know where the hot spots are, put those in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. hundred <laughs> yeah, percent. But we're not going to cover those today. Jake, you got anything? Close no, this out. I don't think so. No, Mike. Anything? Oh, I just, I just want to say thanks, and I want to wish everybody well in the surgeon experience. There's a lot of great people out there that ha- have their channels, just like this channel. I love to watch them all, um, and uh, it's always neat to see people do stuff and and to see the kids involved in the in the program as well, and and get them going and and to see them spear a fish there. Um, you know, like Brandon with his boys there getting, getting those muskies and stuff like that. And then deer, you see them get deer. And so it's just neat to see that those generations carry on because, you know, if we don't get kids involved in there, um, you know, it's, it's just going to be us and eventually our teeth fall out and our hair and everything else. And then it's (laughs) done. And then, then, you know, who's going to, who's going to champion for these activities and these opportunities that we have right now. And, uh, and it's our youth and getting them involved. And, you know, sometimes they just need that nudge in the right direction and, and the guidance and somebody to take them out, uh, giving them an opportunity, and it, it's great. So just wishing everybody well uh, in in this season. Uh, safety is the most important part, and everybody that, that goes out comes back in. Yeah. And uh, we don't break too much stuff, and, uh, and we make new memories again too. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. That sounds good to me. Well, thank you for coming on. Um, You're welcome back anytime. I'm sure we've got lots more topics to cover. This was just one uh one little 16 day season that we made a whole episode out of so oh my gosh we've it's got, just incredible we, we could do volumes of we this. could we could <laughs> break it down <laughs> break it down <laughs> yep there'll be there'll be much more to come um thank you for being here we appreciate, yeah, appreciate it. it a lot um to those of you who are still watching and listening at this point thank you um make sure you subscribe to the youtube channel um hit the like button leave us a comment um, anybody who's listening, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever, uh, if you could give us a five-star rating, if you enjoy our content, that really helps us out a ton. Um, everybody who's going to be spearing this weekend and beyond, be safe out there. Good luck. Have some fun. Make some new memories. Um, and we can't wait to hear all the stories. So thank you, guys, and we'll see you at once. Definitely at once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, bye.